Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatura, and... Drew Kinnefell. Yay! And <laughs> he my... pronounces it correctly, unlike me. So, where are we today? Well, let's have a look around. So we turn around here. <gasps> We're at... Portsmouth. Portsmouth, yeah. Portsmouth. Portsmouth His Historic Dockyard, my natural environment. <laughs> it's natural. This is where the natural Drakenefell is actually discovered. Mm. Um, so what's so special about this place? So, well, it's been the home of the Royal Navy, the home away from home, for a very long time. I mean, Henry VIII's dry dock is here. It's the first properly working dry dock in Europe. Um, possibly the world, at least for this iteration of dry docks, which, of course, as everyone will know, is a very important thing to me. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's seen all sorts of things. The Mary Rose sailed from here on her last voyage. Well, yeah. she's still here now. After and sunk voyage. here. Yeah, <laughs> sunk in the Solent. It's seen so many battles, um, and it's obviously there's other been other south coast ports, but this one has been consistently used all through the years. Yeah. So what this is, essentially, is because Drac and I are are doing uh, we've been doing some filming here today uh, for Drax channel but in addition to that we are going to film other things in the future as well and also I've been filming some footage for a little Mary Rose related uh, video uh, that will be going up on my channel uh, but I figured that lots of you who watch my channel unlike Drax channel where everybody knows loads and loads about ships and naval history particularly the Royal Navy lots of you watching my channel don't know very much at all maybe about it and obviously lots of you do watch Drax channel as well which is great but for those of you who don't this is an introduction a whistle stop tour very very uh, relatively short video even for my channel um, of what Portsmouth is why it's important and what's here and why you, why you should visit it maybe if you get the chance so uh, what you see up behind us here is the main kind of uh, road, I'd call it, up, yeah. up the middle of the Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, which is obviously the, there's a large harbour, and it's a, is it a natural harbour uh, originally? It's but, expanded, but yes, it's an, a mostly natural harbour that's then been modified at the edges. So it was seen as strategically well-placed uh, and having some natural geographic features that made it desirable to Henry VIII. And I think it was, it was basically Henry VIII that established things here, wasn't as it? As an official Royal Navy yard, yeah. And Portsmouth yeah. as a town had existed for quite a while because of yeah. its natural advantages, but it was really with the expansion of the Royal Navy in Henry VIII's time that it started to become a major naval base. The Royal Navy was still quite heavily based at Chatham, the Midways, the North, Chatham in Kent, yeah, yeah. Um, all around the Thames, but this now became a, if you like, almost a forward tactical base because France, as usual, was the main enemy, and this is a lot closer to France than right. um, somewhere around the Thames. Yeah, and also, I mean, even if you go all the way back to the Hundred Years' War, the areas of England that tended to get raided predominantly by the French, it has to be said, were along the south coast, weren't yeah. they? And this is kind of in the middle of the south coast, so uh, it means that you can you can get ships out to patrol or uh, defend from here relatively easily, I guess. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the main attractions um, of Port Portsmouth, but also explain to you in a nutshell, in a concise way, why those things are impressive and important. Mm -hmm. So here we are in front of HMS Warrior. HMS Warrior. So this is dating to 1860, or is it yes. 50? Yeah, 60. Uh, and therefore it's slap bang in the middle of the period that I often talk about on my channel. So it's Victorian, uh, what I'd say is mid -Victor early to mid-Victorian. Um, and uh, it's my favourite ship at Portsmouth actually, for a number of reasons, not just because of the date of it, but one, because it's quite nice and spacious inside, <laughs> unlike one of the other ships, in fact, unlike two of the other ships uh, that we're gonna mention here. So, Drac, what is important, or what, what are the most important things to know about HMS Warrior? So, HMS Warrior is the world's first fully, what you did call a fully ironclad warship. So it's preceded by Gloire, which starts the whole ironclad race and revolution, which is a French warship. Of like the year before, wasn't it? Yeah. Or two years before, yeah. Um, but the difference is Gloire is a wooden hull, basically like Victory, which we're going to see later, that they happen to have put some armour plate on. Okay. Whereas Warrior is iron hulled and iron plated with, with armour. So and she's, she's bigger. It does she's have faster. wood as well, doesn't it? Yes, but it only has backing for the armour. It's not structural. So it's almost in reverse. So this is an iron ship with wood added for armour. Well, yeah, that's backing the armour. It's kind of a backing, shock Okay. A, a oh, liner. okay, okay. Whereas the French ship Gloire, mm -hmm. which is quite difficult for an English person to say, was a wooden ship just 
clad in iron. Yeah, with some iron plates strapped to it. So warriors faster, more heavily armed. Um, so it, would you call this better. technically, this is not an iron clad then, is it? Because it's not, the iron isn't cladding. Well, it, I mean, the iron is cladding the, the citadel armour. So okay. it, in addition to having an iron hull. Um, right. But yeah, it, it's... Admittedly, yeah, the term comes from the French ironclad wooden warships, and then it just sticks. And to be honest, okay. they're still calling they're still calling warships ironclads up into the early 20th century, when actually by that point they're all using steel anyway. <laughs> okay. And my understanding is that in 1860, when this was built, and it never saw combat, did it? No. But it sailed up and down the the English Channel, more or less, uh, intimidating the French yeah. at a time when the French were being troublesome, as they uh, often were during that period. Um, and uh, there was a genuine genuine real fear that the French might try and invade or try and attack Britain again. Well, yeah, so um, in the sort of 1840s, 50s and 60s, um, France was trying to make a bit of a comeback as a world power and obviously Britain was the preeminent world power so they had to challenge Britain. And the big fear that they had was the new steam engine because okay. up until then you could predict if someone was going to invade Britain based on what the weather was. If the weather was, if the wind was blowing from the north, you weren't going to cross the channel from the south. Right. Whereas with the steam engine, it meant that you could now sail completely independent of the wind, so an attack could come at any time, um, which made everybody a li little bit paranoid. Yeah. And then the, so the French started the steam battleship revolution with the Napoleon. Um, the British followed and outbuilt them, and so you see this pattern all through this time period of the French thinking, oh, we have a technological innovation, this will make us superior. The British then copy it, counter it, and build about 1,500 of them. Um, and the latest idea at the end of the 1850s was, ah, if we make our ships invincible to current era guns by putting iron armor on them, then it doesn't matter that we don't have as many, because if they can't hurt the ones we have, we win. Um, and that was effectively the theory behind Gloire, and then um, the British would just sort of went, yeah, okay, we'll do that, but better, and built Warrior, and then started churning out loads, and that started a whole naval race. So in a nutshell, this ship is very advanced for its time. It's uh, made of iron, so it's very well armoured. It's got, uh, it's quite big, isn't it? And quite fast. Yes. Um, and it's steam powered, of course, super important. But also it had some good new guns on it, didn't yes. it? It had some big breech-loading guns. Yeah, it had, um, it had 64 pounder guns which were very powerful um, and it had 110 pounder breech-loading guns which theoretically were very powerful. Um, they had rifle barrels which again theoretically made them very accurate. Um, unfortunately didn't quite work out as intended. The ones that were manufactured to spec were okay but a bunch of manufacturing issues meant the breaches kept exploding on the bunch of others and oh. the shells went everywhere but where you intended them to go okay. um, there's actually quite an amusing incident around about this time uh, the bombardment of Kagoshima in Japan where they were supposed to be using 110 pounders to shoot up a Japanese fort and you know a fort's not exactly a small target they started the short bombardment and basically hit everything but the fort but the bombardment <laughs> So much of Kagoshima town that the Japanese kind of put their hands up and went, oh, all right. So it worked. Went. It worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. So what we're going to do now is this is a whistle stop tour. We're going to move on to the next very important and very famous ship at Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. We thought we'd just quickly stop and just say this is one of the boathouses behind where they do lots of restoration and recreation, I suspect, of, yeah. of historic vessels. Lots of small craft in there, so it's definitely worth a, a walk around if you fancy uh, learning more about you know, small launches, but ships, boats, etc. Just as you can probably hear in the background, somebody's going mad with a power sander, so we're not going inside. <laughs> yeah, but that, you know, they're actually, you can actually stand in there and see some of what they're doing, uh, some of the work on some of these vessels. So we're not uh, specifically here to see these uh, massive aircraft carriers behind us, but they're there anyway, so we thought we'd yeah. show you. Uh, so these are uh, the UK's two, only two, yeah. aircraft carriers. Only one of them is actually officially seaworthy and in service at the moment, which yeah. is the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Which is the one nearest us. Which uh, obviously has now F-35's um, vertical takeoff ones on it, but they're not on it at the moment because they stay somewhere else when it's in harbour. 
and then Prince of Wales further that, back. That's the Prince of Wales, which is basically still being finished, yes. isn't it? <laughs> Shakedown trials, they call it, otherwise known as <laughs> fix everything that was broken in building. <laughs> Stop the leaking. Yeah. <laughs> but we're actually here, really, to see... Da -da -da. Yeah. So, you'll notice, first thing you'll notice is, where are the masts? Where yeah. are the masts? So, uh, what is this, first so, of all? This is HMS Victory. This is Nelson's flagship at Trafalgar. Um, and yeah, pretty well, it's pretty much the one of the most important warships in the Royal Navy and probably in the world. And it's also the oldest commissioned warship. Yeah, it's still it's still officially a, a commission that, and it has a captain and a yeah. 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 The USS Constitution is the oldest floating wooden warship in the world. OK. Um, but Victory beats her out in service by about 50 years. So you can't see on camera if you don't know this is in dry dock so it's literally it's sitting in a in, well in a dry dock yeah. essentially so suspended um, and uh, for those of you who don't know the Battle of Trafalgar was a very important sea battle in 1805 uh, between the British Royal Navy and a combined navy of the French and Spanish um, fleets. About half the ships were Spanish and half were French, weren't they? I think? Uh, yeah, it was kind of a. In, in terms of the hulls, the balance was a bit towards the French. Okay. In terms of overall firepower, it was much closer to an even split because all the French ships were third rates. Um, the Spanish ah. brought all the first rates that were present in the Franco Spanish fleet, including okay. the biggest warship in the world at the time, which also had possibly the longest name. Yes. Uh, Nuestra Senora de la Santissima Trinidad. Trinidad, which is yeah. Like, I just call it the Trinidad. Yeah. I, and I that had four. Four, four levels, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. The Santissima Trinidad actually started out very much like Victory with three gun decks. Uh, and then you can see over there, there's a few guns pointing out um, from the upper deck where there's just some gun whales. And some absolute genius in the Spanish Navy decided, well, we've got this nice, big, impressive ship. What if we enclose the upper deck and make a fourth gun deck? And then the upper <laughs> deck is another deck higher. Um, which, yeah, it gave it 144 guns. It made it the most heavily armed warship in the world. It made it the largest warship in the world. It also gave it the hand capabilities of a barn um, <laughs> and uh, the Spanish actually ended up nicknaming it El Ponderoso which doesn't really need that much translation so yeah at the, at the moment as we noted it only has two of its masts and not much of those either um, only of the lower half mm. and none of the yard arms and much of the rigging is gone and that so those masts aren't original in fact most of the ship isn't original is it no I mean the masts are the ma masts are metal tubes now um, a lot of the internal structure is well the internal structure structure probably is mostly original, at least as what counts for original, considering the ship was rebuilt several times in her active service career. Um, the outer planking, though, has all been replaced. The decking has been replaced several times. Um, I mean, she was in the water for more than half her life up until the um, early part of the 20th century um, so she in some ways she is a little bit of a ship of Theseus and <laughs> she's going through yet another refit which is why the mast's are down at the moment um, they're going to move on to replanking the exterior of the hull in the next couple of years and then the mast will go back on and so it's continual refurbishment and there are going to be new masts and new rigging and sail well not sails but rigging yeah. anyway are going up um, and but most importantly this is Nelson's flagship as fought uh, and led the, the British fleet at Trafalgar. Incredibly important historically. Um, also, importantly, you can find out far more about it on Drachniffel's uh, channel. <laughs> and we've done a video earlier today where we're actually on board and inside the ship. So, uh, so check that video out as well. Yeah. Battle of Trafalgar special coming up at some point soon. <laughs> some point this year at least. <laughs> so Drac, what's this? This is a World War One monitor. Monitor. No, it's not a battleship. No. <laughs> it's no. much smaller than that. So it's it's relatively small, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, yeah tell us about so it. So it, it doesn't even act, technically have a name as you would think it uh, normally a Royal Navy ship would have a name. This is actually HMS M33. Um, a lot its sister ships of M31, M32, etc, etc. Oh. Um, now this has a single six inch gun forward, uh, which looks quite large, but as you said, that's because it's a fairly small ship. Yeah. Um, so the, this is part of a, a class of monitor and the Royal Navy was building quite a lot of different monitors in World War I uh, because they had issues with things like Gallipoli and also off the um, French and Belgian coast in World War I. And they had 
they had lots of battleships obviously but they needed those in the ground fleet to counter the German fleet and one of the things they realised they could do was build these small ships very quickly and then they could stick some old guns on in this case to say a six incher and they would they're effectively floating artillery pieces okay so so this was supporting the Gallipoli landings yes right so the guns could elevate which didn't go too well no really, no, no. <laughs> no the guns could elevate quite high for a ship oh, okay. at the time so that gave them extra range uh, and it also gave them an excuse to use up say older guns or guns that they couldn't otherwise have use for so, so this one is a fairly short barrel six inch gun so it's an, an older one but perfectly serviceable for shooting at land targets and there were bigger ones with 9.2 inch guns 14 inch guns 15 inch guns um, obviously a bit bigger um, one of the things that distinguishes this smaller class of monitor from the bigger ones is that when you see the hull it's a it looks like a fairly standard ship's hull so yeah. it doesn't have a tremendous amount of underwater protection um, if it got torpedoed it was in trouble okay but at the same time it was built in less than two months so as long as everybody got off wow. no one's really going to cry many tears about it you could easily replace it um, whereas some of the bigger ones um, you'll see there in pictures they have underwater tor anti-torpedo bulges that look incredibly bizarre oh that's what those bulges are for yeah Oh. They're basically big, big spaces full of void, e either void or liquid, or a li mixture of void and liquid. And the idea is basically to detonate the torpedo as far away from the actual hull as possible and wow. absorb the incoming. Um, I never knew what those were for. <laughs> yeah, one of them actually worked a little bit too well. Um, uh, it was a, it was actually a Norwegian coastal defence ship that was repurposed in World War One. Yeah. Um, in the Royal, into the Royal Navy as a monitor. Uh, it became HMS Glatton. It then caught fire in harbour, and everyone was looking at it going, that's an awful lot of explosive in the magazine. We really do not want this to explode in the middle of the harbour. Um, so we need to sink it to put the fire out. Um, so they torpedoed it. <laughs> Except that the anti-torpedo bulges worked perfectly and it didn't go anywhere. Um, so they had to torpedo it again and again and eventually somebody managed to land a torpedo hit in the hole the first torpedo had made, which eventually sent it to the bottom, probably about 10 minutes before it would have detonated with the force of about 100 tonnes of explosive. <laughs> But anyway, a, a, a modest little ship that was thrown together fast and was at Gallipoli and has seen some real history, some horrible history as it turns out, uh, but it's here in Portsmouth and I really like the black and white colour scheme on it. Um, it's like a zebra. Yeah. Uh, I love I love World War One um, camo. Uh, it's very very cool. Right on to the final ship, or not quite ship, but you'll see. <laughs> so to finish up, we don't have a ship as such. We've got a large building because inside the building is about 40 percent of a ship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. So the Mary Rose, uh, which sunk in 1545, it was Henry VIII's flagship. It was I found out from Drac today. It was his second biggest ship, yeah. not his biggest ship. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, incredibly significant. It's a Tudor warship. We've only got one. Yeah. Uh, we've only got one from the 16th century anyway, haven't we? I mean, I've got, I guess, uh, what, uh, what has, what's so important about the Mary Rose? She's basically right on the transition of warship type. So she is actually, and a lot of people think she sank on her maiden board. No, that's Vasa, mm. <laughs> the one in Sweden. Um, Mary Rose was actually quite old when she sank. And as I say, she's a transitional warship. When she's built, she is a classic galleon. She's designed for boarding actions um, pretty much all the guns she has a lot of guns but pretty much all the guns she has are anti-personnel pieces um, they're designed to take out the enemy crew to, and then archers and uh, archivists follow up and then um, the, the infantry will follow up in hand-to-hand -hand engagement mm. by the time that she sinks she's actually been heavily refitted she now has a lot of anti-ship heavy guns which they added in guns at the lower level, the lower levels, they? yeah, yeah. And, and much larger weapons. So she actually carries more guns um, as well as heavier guns by the time that she sinks. And it's actually, in the end, it's that which dooms her because she's still got the high fore and after castles of a galleon designed for hand to hand close range fighting, but she now also has the heavy gun armament of an early ship that's looking primarily at cannon engagements and it turns out that when she goes after the French these gun ports are quite low in the water and as she turns to present another broadside because back in those days as um, well even compared to Victory she's got very short length to beam ratio so Mary Rose's um, way of doing 
gunnery wouldn't be like you would see with Nelson of broadsiding, broadsiding, broadsiding. She'd give a broadside and then turn to present the other broadside and during that time while she's doing basically 360 the other broadside would have a chance to fire, to reload and the fore and aft guns would fire as well. Um, but as she conducts that turn, uh, the wind makes her heel over. She's a top heavy because she's still got these big castles and she heels over far enough the water goes in the gun ports and once that starts these ships don't have any internal bulkheads, massive amounts of flooding and she's gone within minutes. Yeah and of course because at this time um, ships were very much prepared for, for boarding and, and close combat as well. She had um, hundreds of soldiers on board, didn't yes. she? Most famously, the the longbowmen, the English mm-hmm. longbowmen. But um, uh, you know, there were, uh, and they had netting, didn't they? So yes. there was netting over the tops of them that prevented basically them just floating off or falling off into the water and swimming away yeah. um, and so basically she went down with almost all hands on deck didn't yeah she? pretty much anyone who was below decks mm. or even on the main deck with anti-boarding netting above them was basically doomed yeah. um, I, I think one or, t- one or two might have gotten out of the gun ports but pretty much everyone who survived would have been on either on the castles or on the masts or incredibly lucky but not there weren't that many of them although there is a depiction of her sinking which actually shows that when she originally hit the bottom um, because she's out in the solent her masts the tips of her mast were still above the water and there's a few people just holding on yeah rather bemusedly wondering where the rest of the ship's gone <laughs> <laughs> but you know in terms of as, a, as an archaeologist one of the most significant things about Mary Rose is that um, it, the preservation okay so we got absolutely amazing organic material preservations so wood, leather, bone, horn, all of these sorts of things. What didn't survive very well at all was iron. Uh, iron just pretty much almost entirely disappeared. There's only one sword surviving. However, we have lots and lots of sword grips. Um, we've got lots and lots of dagger grips, hundreds of dagger grips for bollock daggers, no blades. Uh, we've got lots of bills and uh, pikes and halberd shafts, but not the heads. Uh, we've got the longbows, that, that, which mean that we know vastly more about the medieval longbow, even though these are Tudor, but we know more about the medieval longbow thanks to the Mary Rose than anything else. Uh, and arrows, of course, minus their heads, minus their fletching. So, uh, in terms of the archaeology, it's an absolutely amazing find, isn't yeah. it? And that's what that museum is full of, is all of the things that came off that ship. And you'll be seeing more of that on my channel and also Drax I imagine as well. Um, so, it's tipping it down. Yes, it, it's typical. It's typical British weather. It's raining. It's freezing cold, and as you can see, the sky is a lovely shade of slate grey. <laughs> In fairness, it is January, and it's about zero degrees out here. So we're going to wrap it up. But we hope that you have enjoyed this whistle stop tour of Portsmouth Historic Duckyard. I should also mention, as well as the things you've seen in this video, there are also several museums here, and there's a slightly separate site which has a submarine on yes. it as well. So there's a hell of a lot to visit here. If you're ever in the south of England, I highly recommend visiting uh, Portsmouth Historic Dockyard and in addition there's Fort Nelson not that far away as well which is an amazing uh, fort essentially of artillery and cannons and guns uh, as well as being a fort um, and amongst the amazing things they've got there they've actually got some of the original guns that were used by the Ottomans to breach the walls of Constantinople. It's like a British museum but for guns. <laughs> yeah basically yes it's well worth visiting. Anyway uh, thanks to Drac for joining me for this uh, you'll see me on his channel as well, and you will be doing uh, more videos in the future. Thanks for joining us. I hope this has been enjoyable, and uh, we'll see you again soon on both our channels. Check out the link below to Drax. Bye. <laughs> see you, folks.